I'm thrilled that you're here today with us. I'm thrilled that you've allowed me to, uh, I'm thrilled to be with you rather, and thank you Dr. Quinn and thank you Mr. President, appreciate you and all of you who were involved in having me come. I wanna share briefly uh, something that I like to talk about today. It's called the promised land. Most of you prayed to be here. You had to apply. Uh, they, there had to be a season when you said, I dream to go to Vanguard. I dream to go to college. I want a degree in whatever your degree's in. The question is, are you surprised? What are the surprises you've dealt with in this promised land? If you think about your life for a minute, and if you look at it and you say, this is the promised land, but it is surprising to me. It's surprising that I have to do this much work. Surprising when the professor walks out and he shows you the syllabus and you go, you gotta be kidding. I remember when I first went to college and uh, the professor came out and he gave me the work, I thought, you know, I have other classes. But there was something about that stretching moment that touched me in a way that has changed my life. Because I've learned that whenever you have a promised land, there are surprises, things you didn't expect, things you didn't believe would happen to you. There are a lot of moments in life when you think you've got it all figured out. But it's not until you get there. And in the Bible, there's this great story. Numbers chapter 13, and because you're Bible scholars, I don't have to read it all for you. It's Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14. It's the story of Israel landing in the promised land, standing on the borders of Kadesh Barnea, a place where now the dream was going to come true. Just like you. Here you are, standing on the borders of the promised land. You're in college. You're building your academic strength. You're preparing for your future. Some of you have a dream of a husband and a wife and children and ministry and church and expansion and missions work. You have a, a dream of starting a business. You have a dream and all those dreams are great. But I will promise you that there are surprises in your promised land. When you get there, there will be things you didn't expect. Now you have to understand in the book of Numbers when you get to the story when Israel's on this promised land border is the culmination of generations of dreams. For many generations, they were people who, who were in slavery in Egypt, and now they were the ones who had arrived at the place of victory. They were the ones who were now going to have this great opportunity. They were the ones. For some of you, you are the one. You get to go to college. Nobody else in your family did. You were the one. You feel the pressure in the moment. What's it like for you now that you're here? Are you discouraged today? Are you so frustrated with this, quote, promised land that you're now saying, I don't know if I want to stay? I don't know if, this is, if I'm cut out for this. And it's all because of the surprises in your promised land. Here's the deal, I promise you. You're gonna fall in love, some of you. Some of you are already there. <laughs> you just know this is the guy. You're gonna walk down the aisle, and you're gonna go, oh boy, this is it. And he's gonna stand there, and he's gonna be all dressed up in a suit he rented. <laughs> and he's gonna come down the aisle, and you're gonna say, oh man, and let me tell you, when that day happens, I do weddings all the time. And you just see this love dripping off people. And then a few months later, they're calling me. Surprises in the promised land. <laughs> Can you believe he snores? Can you believe? I mean, when we got married first night. It's true, first night, first night marriage. I cut the light off, she cuts it on. Off on. I can't believe it. The woman wants to be in the light. I want to be in the dark. I don't want to see anything. I'm like a bat. No light. <laughs> Nothing. She wants the light on. She's just, we're different. She's louder than me. I'm quieter. Her office is across the hall from mine in our church. I'm telling you, she's jamming over there. She got the music all cranked up. I said, Diane. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Man of God across the hall trying to meditate. So I told her, when we build our new facilities, you're going to be way on the other side. <laughs> of course, I had to repent because she didn't like that idea. But what's amazing is there are always surprises. Say that with me, please. Come on. Say there are always. always. Come on, join me, people. Come on. Say there, there are always, always surprises, surprises in the promised land. In the promised land. And I want you to remember that. It's incredibly true. 
I want to make just a few observations about the promised land. And again, because you're Bible scholars, I'm not going to read the whole text. This is, you read it on your own. Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. Here's the first thing I want you to notice. First thing I want you to notice in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, there were 12 hand-picked guys. Hand-picked guys. Imagine what that's like. 12 hand-picked guys to go and spy out the promised land. Be one of the 12 guys. Imagine that. We have a secret mission for you guys. We want you to go like 007, spy out this land, and come back with a report. Now what you find is these 12 guys were diligent. In verse 26, they departed, came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and they brought back word. They went and did their jobs, but in Numbers 13, 26, they come back and they give a report. 26 through 33. In Numbers chapter 13, they give back this incredible summary. And it all sounds good. But the one thing that they threw in that was a bit of an awkward thing was they, they start talking more about the difficulties and the surprises than the good things. If you go to a school like this, you can start out and you can have a really good opinion on the first day, first week. But if you're not careful, you will start focusing on the difficulties rather than the joys. Your whole mindset can switch in your marriage to what's negative than what's positive. It's so easy if you're not careful to lose sight. I see pastors all the time. Their focus quickly moves from the joy of ministry to the challenge of it. I mean, you know, this week there's a whole lot of stuff. I, I teach, you know, tonight. I teach just today, rather, and then I teach six times this weekend and then, then Tuesday. And I teach in Savannah, too, by video, by the way, three times. So I get to talk a lot. I'll be seen a lot this week. But what an opportunity. You know, it, it, you can sit there and you can, you can struggle and have a hard time with how difficult things are, or you can focus on the great things. These guys go into the promised land. They get there, they spy it out, and the first thing they need to come back and say, well, it was great, but, you know, I, I, it was wonderful, but, you know, this teacher's great, but, it's always the but. And if you're not careful, that becomes your life. They were surprised by the challenges. Here's what they told him in Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. They, then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flowed with milk and honey. Hey, look, there's great, great housing there. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, but the people who dwell in the land, you know, they're really strong. They got big muscles. And the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Okay, now you don't know who those are guys, all right? Then you saw the Amalekites there. Okay, that, they're verse 29. That's bad. The Hittites are there. The Jebusites are there. The Amorites are there. The Canaanites. Now, you, you read these names and you go, well, what's that? Let me, let me change them a little bit. The Crips were there. <laughs> the Bloods. <laughs> Gangbangers. I mean, okay. When you put those names in, you go, okay, we get it. These are not people you want to be around. And so here's what happens. They became divided over the possibilities. One group said we can do it. One group said we can't. Caleb stands up, quiets the people, verse 30 of Numbers chapter 13. And he says, hey, look, let us go up. We can take over. We can take them. And you, you, you feel this tremendous excitement when one guy stands up, but the 11 guys said, forget it. Well, the 10 guys said, forget it, rather. Not, we, we can't do it. Here's what they said in verse 30. These are the words that will haunt you. These are the words that will trash your degree. These are the words that will stop you from reaching your potential. These are the words that will stop you in business. These are the words that will wreck your life. We are not able. That's what they said, verse 30. The men who had gone up with him, 10, of the, 10 out of the 12 said, we are not able. Only Caleb and Joshua said yes. What do you keep saying you're not able, able to do? And the Bible goes on and says, verse 32, they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. That was it. Now, this is that moment when you sit there and you go, okay, so what do we do now? Think about this for a minute. I'll give you a formula. When something's tough, if you sit there and say, I can't do it, well, guess what? You can't do it. And you won't do it, so it never gets done. So why not say, I'm going to try to do it? I love the book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because one of the, it's a great little book if you've never read it, but it's a, about a guy who, uh, his parents were college professors, and then there was a guy who was in real estate, 
and they lived next to each other and they became friends. And so it's a story of the guy talking about how his dad was compared to the, his neighbor, his friend, who was a rich dad. His dad had, the other dad had rich, real estate dad had more money. And he, he, in the book, he chronicles how they fought as a family. And there were certain things that were outlawed in his rich dad's friend's home. He could never say we can't because he said it shuts down your brain. So we're not going to even try now. We just gave up on this class. We just gave up on this relationship. We just gave up on my whole life. So we just sit here and say, we can't. That's what these guys did. They shut down all possibilities. Caleb tried, Joshua tried, nothing worked. And so they became disappointed. And the sad part is then they turned in chapter 14 on the leadership and said, let's just kill Moses. Let's leave these guys. It's amazing who you turn on. You'll turn on your parents. You'll turn on your professors. You'll turn on your friends. You'll turn on people when life doesn't go the way you want if you're not careful. When you become disappointed, watch yourself. You start misapplying blame. You spend your whole life dwelling on what's wrong with you. I always tell people, listen, if it's difficult, if it's tough, why talk about it like that? I mean, really. I mean, look, if you, you ever seen anybody, now, now, now hear this right. You see her with a guy, and you can't believe she got that guy. <laughs> Have you ever, you, you can look like you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, you said, oh, you're kidding. You're with her. Did you look in the mirror? Did you see her? Here's the deal. She doesn't believe she has a problem. You do. She's looking beyond her flaws. She may be a little bit of this and not have a little bit of that, but she's working with what she has. Same thing with a guy. A guy who believes that he can. A pastor who believes that he can. A guy who thinks that my world is not going to be over because of this flaw or that flaw. That person has a greater potential to try. And they're not going to blame anybody. Listen, I'm not going to blame my daddy. I can tell you a story. I was raised by a single parent. I can tell you that I grew up in southern, south, south central L.A. I can tell you all the things that I, I ran from the Crips, for real, and the Bloods. I can give you many stories that would have, could have prohibited me from being here today. But I'm here. We didn't own a washing machine. We washed clothes in the sink. We had to hang our clothes out on the line. We did that in L.A., and they stole my pants. <laughs> so sad Ricky stories. We can, we can run down the row here. But that's not important. That's my story that, is, that has value. But the question is, am I allowing that to define the boundaries of my life forever? You were abused. I, my heart goes out to you, but do not allow yourself to be abused forever. Do not allow yourself to be defined by what happened to you or defined by something that looks intimidating to you. Now, I'm not saying go out here, kick indoors and act like a ninja. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say become this aggressive, overly, you know, mean person. I'm simply saying pause for a minute and ask yourself, is this working for me? If it's not working, what can I do to change it? Here's what you can do. Take charge of your challenges. That's what they were asking them to do. That's what they did the second time they came to this place. You see, 40 years later, they come back to the same growth place. See, if you fail now, you have to try again later. You have to face your fears. Face them now or face them later. You have to come to a place where you're willing to sacrifice. So here's what some people didn't like. Going over there meant somebody may die. Everybody doesn't get to go home. And I have to go home. So what, I, what do I do? Do nothing. In my life, I've learned there are all kinds of surprises in the promised land. I want to name four of them. I want you to write these down because these are important. You ready? Take these home with you. These are important. When you get to your promised land, there's going to be management demands that are surprising. For me in ministry, that's the greatest surprise. It's not just about preaching, people. It's about management, especially when, as your staff grows, especially as you manage thousands and thousands of people and millions of dollars if you're blessed to have that opportunity. I'm telling you, even if it's 100 people, it's all about management. Secondly, the money management issues. Lord have mercy. I love this one. A friend of mine said the other day, uh, Jimmy Evans from Marriage Today, we was teaching one day. He said, you know, you just get tired of living on just on the other side of broke. The management of money becomes the issue. The marriage pinches, I call it. The marriage pinches. It seems like ministry will pinch your family. Squeeze them out of your life if you're not careful. So you got the management demands, the money management issues, the marriage issues, the personal temptations to be insecure issues. 
If you want to know a bunch of people that could be insecure, look at preachers. Lord have mercy. It's amazing. Did I do good? Am I preaching well? How did I do today? And then you have what I call the temptation to walk by sight and not by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 is a strong verse. Live, live by for the rest of your life. You walk by what? Faith and not by sight. You will never see everything. I have learned in my life that the promised land has surprises, but I have a surprise for the promised land. My God is able. On him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think. But God is not normally my problem. God is never my problem. Really, it's me. I'm imbalanced. And I've learned some smart things to do. Here's number one. Take a Sabbath and rest. Number two, take care of your health. Exercise. Eat right. Number three, be emotionally balanced. Admit when you're off emotionally and you need to be on. Take time to manage your money. Do not get in foolish debt and end up owing, spending your life owing banks and only owing people. Debt has a place when it's wisely used, but a lot of us aren't wise with our debt. And then here's the last one. Be transparent and let qualified people help you. Being a transparent person can transform your life. Letting somebody in so you're not alone. And here's what I believe. You'll make it through the promised land, but write this verse down. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible it's a theme to a book I'm writing, Exodus chapter 23, verse 29 through 30. Here's what it says. Exodus 23, 39 through 30. I will not drive them out before you in one year. When they got to the promised land, he told them, you will not get it in one year. He says, least the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. If I give it to you one time, you can't manage it because there's too many beasts, there's too many things to manage. But little by little, I will drive them out before you. And you will have increase and you will inherit the land. But it's little by little. You'll get there, but not in one day. Stand with me if you're marching to the promised land. I want to pray a prayer for you. Father, today we stand acknowledging your grace in our life and acknowledging your call upon us. We understand there's surprises in the promised land, but we have faith to believe we can make it through it. We thank you and give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Bless every student as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for having me. God bless you. At Vanguard University, your story matters. Where will it take you next? For more information, please visit vanguard.edu.